تأكلون من هذا الخبز وتشربون من هذه الكاس تبشرون بموتي وتعترفون بقيامتي وتذكروني الآن In the name of the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. In the readings of Sundays of the Church, there is a curriculum, there is a, an arranged teaching that we follow. The last four weeks, we had the subject of the Kingdom of God, Jesus the King, and how we saw in this topic in this chapter of the reading, Jesus, to rise to power, had to conquer three enemies, the enemies of humanity, the reason for all evil in the world. And the three, the three enemies that he conquered, and we saw them in order, was the devil, the first one, then the devil who enticed us to sin, that's the second one, sin is conquered, and then the third one is death and death is conquered. Those three enemies, Jesus one after another, he was victorious over. And I remind you the first, first uh, gospels in, the, in this, in the last month, or in the month before, it was actually almost four, four weeks in a row, was about uh, Jesus casting out demons. Casting out demons. And it follows his work in the desert when he was fasting, conquering the devil himself. And the second was, the second item was forgiving sins, very simply, and it shocked the Pharisees that he was forgiving sins. Because he came to conquer sin too. Sin has no dominion over us. Jesus conquered it. Anyone who sin, repent, come back to God and come to church and receive forgiveness. And he would say it very clearly, your sins are forgiven. Everybody would be like, what is, what's he doing? He showed that power. And the third one, and we saw that when he touched the, the coffin of that young man of the widow, and he stopped it and he raised that young man. And this will, ha will, ha will be the small picture of what Jesus would do in his cross and resurrection. And I thought about this, um, you know, when, uh, when you have kings in the old ancient times, in the ancient times, in the time of Alexander the Great, Napoleon Bonaparte, or uh, you can have uh, the great kings who went into big fights. They used to lead their army. Then they come back. When they come back from leading the army, the capital received them with a great excitement. And I thought about this the other day, and I thought, this is very important why Jesus had Palm Sunday. That Palm Sunday is a victorious entry. And we know that. It's a victorious in entry of a king who conquered. But what did he conquer, actually, that to, get, to, get to, receive, to receive that? St. John says it very clearly. He said, everyone in Jerusalem heard about him raising Lazarus from the dead. They knew that he had done this. So to them, he is the real king. He is the son of David, who came to the capital of Israel victorious, riding on a horse. And everybody cheered for him. Save us, O son of David. Save us. They knew that he would be the savior. And then Jesus will accomplish this by his death on the cross. And he said this, he said, by when I'm lifted up and I'm gone onto the cross, the prince of this world will be cast out, meaning he would lose his dominion. And Jesus said very clearly, the devil has dominion over every flesh since Adam. So by ascending to the cross, Jesus knocked that king off the throne and took his place. And that's why he comes back in the resurrection and he receives dominion. He said, every power on earth and in heaven has been delivered to me. So we saw that kingdom coming with power and we are living this kingdom today. Any person who is believing in Christ, baptized and in the church, receiving his body and blood is in that dominion. He lives in the kingdom of Christ until his second coming. Now we move, we shift gears. So the readings now from the kingdom of God that is established by Christ as a powerful king, the victorious king from God, the king of kings, to 
the word of God. This kingdom has to be preached, cannot be silent, cannot be kept hidden. The kingdom has to be preached, to be talked about. That's the commission that Jesus gave to the disciples. He said, go to the whole world, preach the kingdom, and teach them everything I have taught you, and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit. So he is telling this that after the kingdom has been established, it has to be brought to every corner of the earth. Yes, the kingdom of Christ is not from of this world, but it has to be in every street and every alley and every house of the world, if possible. So that's why the church shift gears from the focus on the kingdom of God that is established by his son to the word. Today and next Sunday, the, ch the church will read the parable of the sower and the seed. This is the focus. So the kingdom is preached. And this is where we hear about the sower and the seed. In this gospel today, we, uh, we have Jesus tell a parable. A parable is a simile. It's almost like a fairy tale, a small example that Jesus is making that give us a picture of what the kingdom of God is and what the word of God is. So he said, a farmer, a sower, went out to sow his seed. To sow the seed is to scatter them. Take a bag of seed, and you know, we, we're not familiar with this, but, but in North Carolina, there are a lot of farmers, they know what that means. At least if you had been um, around someone who's uh, growing grass in their yard, you would know what that means. You have to put topsoil and then bring seed to the, to the ground. And all what you do is to have to scatter the seed and then uh, wait for rain. That's why people do this in the fall, usually, because fall has a lot of rain. And that's what they advise, that you put your seed in the fall. So he said, that he said and he, he took his bag and went to, to the field to put the seed. Some of him, of his words, of his seed, I'm sorry, of his seed, as he scatters them, fell by the wayside. They went all the way to the very compacted soil, the asphalt or the rocks, where it's very compacted. They cannot, the seed cannot go in. And some went by the wayside. I'm sorry, someone went by uh, the rocky places, rocky places. So every road has very compacted surface. But on the side, you see, as it fades into the field, as it goes down, you have exposed rocks mixed with soil. But nobody walks on this side, so it is, keeps its soil. There is a little bit of soil on top of it. And then as you go down, there's a ditch. Always. In that ditch, there's a lot of wild plants. If you look at the, our roads, you will see there is a little swell where water accumulates. But in that swell, because water accumulates from rain, you have wild plants. Nobody cares to clean them unless they block the drainage. But if they don't block the drainage, they leave them. It's thorny, wild stuff that you don't gather anything from. And then eventually, the main bulk of the seed went into the the tilled ground, the good soil. And uh, then what do you expect? The results are said. Jesus said the results. The road ones, the compact ones, nothing. Nothing. The seed was, was there until the birds came and picked it up. Why? He's saying it. It has no depth. It has no depth. There is no depth to the soil. There is nothing there. The next one has a little bit of soil because nobody step, steps on it, and it's give the, give the seed some life, some nutrients. But it didn't reach anything. Once the sun was hot and, and hit it, it dried up. Nothing happened. And then the ones in the thorny places, it had a soil. It went all the way down until it reached a very good depth, and then started to pick up roots and brought a uh, a plant, but not fruit, not mature to, to reach the fruitful stage, was stumped. And then the last ones fell on the good ground. There was nothing to hinder it from maturing to completeness, it was completely mature, and reached the stage of bringing fruit. And the fruit in this case, if it's a wheat or, or a barley um, or chauffin or something of those seeds, it, you would see the, the grains coming you would see the kernels and the, and the seed and, 
and the, and the whole thing. So, why is Jesus saying this about the Word of God? So he's explaining it actually to the, to the disciples. So I said, so what does this mean? Yeah, we understand the farming business, but what does it mean? He said, to you it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. This is the mysteries of the kingdom of God, which is the word that he is speaking. But to the others, it was being given them in parable. Why? Why would he give others parables? That's very difficult to understand. It needs to be explained. And he said that because they don't want to listen. In, in Judaism, in ancient Judaism, the rabbis used to say to say stories, to highlight points. And they say, if the person is interested, what would they do? They would ask. If they are interested, they will learn. But if they are not interested, we wouldn't give them anything. If someone is not interested, nothing will be given to them. Because basically you give them something very special, very important, very precious, and what would they do? Throw it away. So, let them wonder. The best thing to teach is to let the person wonder. What does this mean? And if they have that heart, the noble heart who inquires, they will be asking questions. This is actually the basic, basic principle of classical education. The, the learning through question and answer. We call it the Socratic method. This is how the philosophers in old times used to do. So Jesus is saying, they are not interested. If they are interested, they will ask, like you. The apostles were very interested. They said, what could this parable mean? What could it mean? Very important. And this is the first, first lesson in approaching the word of God. What could this mean? A person who hears the word of God and doesn't ask that, ask that question, not going to get anything. What could this mean? So, he explained it. He said, the seed is the word of God. Very, very precious. And why the word of God is a seed? Why is it not something else? In fact, the Bible speaks about the word of God. As I gather, maybe you can get more. I gathered at least five parables. Five that speaks about the word of God. Think about them. What else the Bible said about the Word of God? Not just the seed. But we'll talk about the seed here because this is our subject today. The Word of God in Matthew and Luke in the Gospels is a seed. In St. Saint, Saint Peter, especially 1 Peter, what did he say, the Word of God? It's a seed, 1 Peter chapter 1, and in chapter 2 he said, it's milk. He said, we are born of the word of God, but we are nourished by it. He said, as a newborn babies, he said, be nourished, seek, seek the undefiled milk, the unadulterated milk that you grow by it. So the word of God in St. Peter mind, not just a seed, seed also and nourishment, milk. And we're going to have to ask ourselves, what does that mean? The word of God is milk. And the third image that the Bible gives us about the word of God a sword, or well, you go from food to something very offensive. Yeah, the word of God can be a sword. And uh, St. Saint Paul especially, in his letter, uh, I'm sorry, it's the letter to the Hebrews, whether it's St. Paul or uh, someone else. The letter to the Hebrews, chapter 4, he says, the Lord of God is living, sharper than two-edged sword. What does that mean? The word of God actually does not leave you alone. It would have to poke you and would poke everybody who hears it. It would go so deep in the person to reach places that no one can reach. That's what the Word of God is about. And it would separate. It would go in and separate light from darkness, evil from good, bitter from sweet. It will define everything you're thinking and everything you're doing. And it would make it very clear to a painful degree. So, it is sweet like milk, it's nourishing, it's lively like a seed, beautiful and green, but it's very dangerous. I'm going to tell you that. No one knows the Word of God and stays the same. It's also light. Light. It says The psalmist says that in, in the big psalm, the, the biggest psalm, Psalm 119 in the Hebrew, 118 in the Septuagint. It's, it's a 
It's an interesting psalm. It is the biggest chapter in the whole Bible from beginning to end, and it's the center of the Bible. And it's a basically a serenade. What's a serenade? A love song to the Word of God. It's a very unique psalm. We pray it at midnight. We, the church prays it at midnight. And it's, it's a beautiful song. It just amazes me every time I think about this psalm because every verse, it has 170 verses. Every verse contains the Word of God. Either you hear commandment, law, statutes, uh, words, sayings, so rules. You're going to have the Word of God. If you're going to go that home and do this, practice, do it. Pick up your Bible. Open Psalm 119. And if, you, if it's in Agbeya, you will find it in the first watch of midnight. And it's divi divided into pieces according to the alphabet, the Hebrew alphabet. And each piece would have few verses. Total is around 170. And each verse has the Word of God in it. And it's every single verse of them is a love song to the Word of God. And one of those verses says, Your word, O Lord, is light to my way and a lamp to my feet. Your word, O Lord, is a lamp to my feet and light to my way, light to my path. So the, the psalmist think of the word of God as something shines. He says, it shows me the way. Though your word clarify for me, where am I going? What am I doing? If I need any, anything to ask myself about anything, if it's good or bad, or it's right or left, or up or down, I go to the Word of God. The last image I could gather, the Word of God is a mirror. A mirror. That's St. James. In the letter of James, he speaks about the Word of God as a mirror. And uh, it's a very complex uh, imagery he's giving. He said, anyone who listens to the Word of God and doesn't, is not intending to do it. It's like someone who looks at the mirror, at his face in the mirror, and turns around, and he forgets what he saw. It's a very interesting image. He says, if we are listening to the Word of God, what's he talking about? If you're listening to the Word of God and not intending to do what the Word is saying, what does that mean? How is, how is that, how do you explain this situation? Let's look at it very carefully. He says, you're listening to the Word of God and not intending to do anything. I give the example of an old lady sitting in front of the TV listening to the food channel or watching a food channel. The recipe is about making different kind of delicate food or delicious dishes. If she's just looking to spend time, what happens? Does she get anything? Why? How would you know that? She doesn't pay attention. She's not paying attention. Because she's not going to do it. But look at like a young wife who knows that her husband likes certain food. And she's looking to the same channel at the same time. What would she do? She would get up, bring a notepad, a pen, and then what? She's going to start writing. Maybe she will record it. She will go back and review it and rewind it maybe 10 times until she gets every detail that is said in this lesson about that dish. Because she wants to, really, to do it. So she had not done it yet. But the way people listen is different. So what St. James is saying, it's like a mirror, that when you look at it, it's almost the difference between me, and the priest here with the beard, and, and my, my, the way the face, my, my face is, and a young lady who wants to look at the mirror. Both of us will go to the bathroom, look at the mirror. I will turn around. I, have, I don't remember what, what was there. And she would remember every detail in that picture. And she, because she wants to do something about it. So that's what St. James is saying. If you are going to attend, and this basically refers to what type of soil in the parable of Christ? Which soil? Which part of this process of sowing that would correspond to this mirror image that Jesus said, those who intend to listen but have no intention of doing, is like people look at the mirror and forget about it. Which soil do you think is that? It is the road, the first one. There's nothing happening to this word, no, nothing happening to the seed. The seed doesn't go anywhere. Just 
Sometimes I do this test in the church and I say, okay, let's test. What was the gospel today? I'm, 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 I'm going to ask. You've been exposed to the word of God, the most precious thing we have. And I get no answer. What was the Pauline letter from St. Paul? It means we are not interested, basically. Let's not kid ourselves. But if the Bible and, and the, uh, the church teaches us that the word of God is extremely important for our growing, and it's extremely important to give us that nourishment that we need, of course, we, we, it's not the only nourishment. We do have the Eucharist. But it's nourishing because we need it for our mind. We need it for our heart. We need it for our emotions and for our stability, for our guidance, for our discipline. So to know what the will of God is. When you go focus on the seed, the last thing I'm going to say, the seed, what does the seed have as qualities? What, what are the qualities of the seed? The first quality that I think is we need to ex extremely pay attention to is life. The seed is alive. St. Paul would say this. Even when he said it's a sword, two-edged sword, he said it's living. What what does that mean to me when I say the seed is living? When I was younger, we used to go to the monasteries, sit with the monks, and we hear about the stories of martyrs and saints and who spend a lot of time with God, and I thought, I wish I can be that. I, can, I wish I can have that zeal and that spirit to follow God with all my heart. But then I didn't. But then... I also wanted to, to consecrate my life and say, okay, I'm going to live for just serving Christ, but I can't. Right now I have a lot of other ambitions. I do have things to think about. I want to study, I want to finish this, I want to go places, and I want to do this, and I want to do that. But I knew if the Word of God is in me, I will be changed. This is the key. I'm not going to change myself. I'm interested to do it, but not yet. That's St. Augustine too. St. Augustine said, when he was living in sin. Lord, I want to repent. I want to change. I want to be holy. But I love sin too much. Not today. But what happened? The word of God changed him with time. That's why Jesus in the gospel, he says, those who are in the good soil, they will produce fruit with patience. You, you know, when you try to see a plant, put the seed. I see kids and still do it. I used to do it when I was younger. We used to have this science experiment in the class. We take the beans and we put them in a cotton plate, like a petri dish, and we put water. And we, we cover them because you have to cover them so they don't get dry. So I remember every morning I wake up, the first thing I do, what I pick the cotton and I look at the and the seed. I used to do that when we had, when I was with my grandmother who had a yard and we used to plant things. I go and pick at the ground to see if the seed is sprouting or not yet. And I remember my uncle say, don't do that, you're going to kill them. So we are very rushed, very rushed into our, or in a hurry to see changes. But it doesn't happen this way. Life has to take its time. You're going to have to have that word of God in you and wait. It will produce fruit if you give it some time. But not only time. What else needed for a regular seed? You need some nutrients. And the, the best nutrients you can give to the Word of God is faith. You trust. This is important. This is very essential for me. I can't have that Word of God and I don't have trust. I don't have faith in it. I should keep it like a treasure. So what Jesus said, like a mustard seed or like a hidden treasure, we have to keep it like a treasure in our hearts. What does that mean? I'll tell you what it means. That you spend time thinking about it. You give it out of your life, your time. That's the essence of your life, time. So you hear, you hear a word from the church or from your Bible reading at home, and you keep it with you. But you know what we do? This is what happens. We listen or read, and then what? We're in rush to hear something else. We are in a hurry to see something else. We're in a hurry to experience something else. Two things that means. This means, one, there's something more important than the Word of God. 
Two, you don't care. And the result is, the word of God is not going to grow. That is the heart that is hard like a stone. There is nothing there for God. There is nothing for his word. A saintly person who loves God, and that, that's the good field, who loves God and loves the word of God, they give it all it, their power, like a mother, hosting a little embryo in her womb. The, the embryo is made out of the bone, the hair, the skin, the liver, the heart of the mother. The blood of the mother carries all the nutrients from everywhere to bring it to that baby, and that baby grows to become a human being. No human being comes out of nothing. It has to come from the mother womb, from the nutrients and the oxygen and the calcium and everything the mother can, can support. So the Word of God takes us, takes from us to become a tree. That's why we have to give it our life. We have to give it our full attention, our energy. What do we give our attention, our energy to? Social media? Friends? Believe it or not, words of friends are more powerful to us than the words of Christ. Believe it or not, the words of some guy or a girl in the media is much more powerful and lasting than the words of Christ to us. St. Anthony one time was given a letter from Constantine the king, and they told him, Anthony, the king is sending you a letter. He's a holy king. He built a church. He's great. He's wonderful. He said, wait a minute. I didn't finish the letter from the king of kings yet. He didn't finish reading the word of God. So we need to think of that. Think of what we hold as the highest thing. And the word of God is alive. And it will change us. Then you have that first psalm that says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the way of the ungodly, who sits with the mockers, who sits not with the mockers, but in the word of God, his meditation day and night. He becomes like the tree planted by the waters, the streams of water. It's the, the, that tree, leaves will not wither and will produce fruit in its time. In its time. So that's the, the idea, the image. And that, of course, that he speaks about Christ. That's the incarnate word of God who is just the Word of God. He is the Word of God, became flesh. And we need to have the same thing. He gave us the same ability. He gave us the power, the, the, the right to become the children of God, who was born not of flesh, not of blood or the will of man, but born of God. And the apostles would tell us this is the effect of the Word of God. We read the Word of God over the water to sanctify the water. We read the Word of God over the bread and wine to sanctify the bread of wine. You read the Word of God at your home to sanctify your food. We come to bless the whole houses. And St. Paul taught us this and we're doing it. He said everything is sanctified and blessed and became, becomes godly by prayer and the Word of God. So on, on another aspect, everything around us will be sanctified by the Word of God. That's why in all our traditions, in all our work in the church, we have prayers and readings, prayers and readings. And we do this in everything we do. But when we do it, things are transformed. The bread becomes the body of Christ. The wine becomes the blood of Christ. The water is transformed from a regular water that you see everywhere to a birth-giving water, to a life-giving water that Jesus spoke about. Anyone who has to be born or to be born of the water and spirit to, be, to see the kingdom of God, to enter the kingdom of God. And everything we do has to involve the word of God in everything you do. I ask that you do not harden your heart. You, you soften your heart because you are the children of God. And you take this seriously. The word of God has to be in our mind and our mouth and our heart all the time. All the time. To really become, to be transformed. It might not be easy to shut down things and to keep them away as unimportant as much as we can. But really, think about it. We spend a lot of time with unimportant things. It doesn't matter, really. And I would say it's very powerful. One person can tell you a bad word about another person. It will change your way of seeing the person, how you deal with them. That's only a regular human word. How about the word of God that will change our hearts and our life to become like him, to become like Christ. We ask him to do that in us, 
very powerfully so that you shine as the light of the world and the salt of the earth. To him is the glory, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen.